Welcome to the first ever episode of Throw Like a Girl Radio, the podcast. I'm Melissa Policelli. And I'm Karen Angelotti. It seems like just yesterday, Karen and I were back at good old Brooklyn College. I know. On the mic for the first time in WBCR. It's a little weird now. Like we're in my bedroom. I know. It's really, it's really I wish I was in a radio studio right now. I was just telling Alyssa that because this is really different. And how long has it been? Like, it's been a while. A couple of months? It's been a while. Since we've last there's spoken been about a, sports. There's a lot of stuff that's gone on since. So much has gone on. But we're going to start transitioning into different topics now from what we've done on radio. Exactly. So we're looking to take our platform of talking about and highlighting women in sports and giving it to you in a little bit of a shorter segment yeah. with a little bit of more interviews with people yeah. that we admire, people that we... Um, We've spoken about on our radio show, too, and now we're going to actually get them on our podcast, hopefully, to just speak about their experiences in the industry. And Exactly. This podcast, just to let everyone know, is going to be a bi-weekly podcast, and if you have any questions or you want to email us with any segment ideas or any people we should interview, you can always email us at throwlikeagirlradio at gmail.com. We have a Twitter account, throw like a It's been a little dry girl. lately, all of our social I know, media. But it was our be last picking. post. It was about Pat Summit. <laughs> yeah, which is exactly. Pat Summit had passed since we yeah. last spoke. Like, we weren't even on the air for I that. know, we weren't. So we got to get our social media accounts going. And we have the Facebook account, facebook.com slash throw like a girl radio. And now it's not radio anymore, so we got to change it to podcast. I know, I know. We got to like, we're gonna, we have to come up with a new logo, all this stuff we're that needs to get done. We're gotta... Look at this. Yeah, I'm, it's so it's literally so weird that we're in my bedroom So how do you right feel? Like, we just graduated. My... We're sitting in your room. Yeah. How do you feel it, right now? Honestly, it's weird because we've only graduated. We graduated later than most people. So we graduated yeah. like, the first week in June. And I feel like most people kind of have most of the month of May after they graduate. Yeah. Or they have that like... They have those couple weeks to be like, oh my god, I just graduated. Yeah, and they can relax and just try right. to figure out our lives. And now we're in June, and we're just like, and we I feel get like the ball we rolling. kind of just like jumped into whatever we had. Like yeah. I, I literally we graduated on a Thursday. I started work on a Sunday. I know, me too. Like, I started, I started, I moved to the city for a fellowship yeah. two days later. <laughs> was, so I feel insane. like it's kind of been like go go go. It's been going. It's been nonstop, and just us trying to get together has been a task in and of itself. Karen and I are completely opposite schedules. She works during the day. I work overnights. Yes, and, and sometimes I work overnights. It's just I work three jobs, and Alyssa <laughs> works. Three jobs. Three jobs, too, and it's just how we're handling this, but we're very excited to speak to you guys about topics in sports and things that we truly care about, and guess what happened over the summer? The Olympics! One of the biggest sporting events in every four years. Every two years. Two, oh, well, the well, summer the one, Olympics summer, is every four, right. and the winter Olympics is every four, but... The and, Olympics is every two. Yes, right. and with all the controversy that's been going surrounding Rio, I think it has been a successful Olympics. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, if you think about just the United States performance yes. from that kind of perspective, it yes. was, as usual, we led the way in medal in the medal count. But we crushed the medal count. It, didn't, it wasn't like a little right. different, different. I also think that that has a lot to do with just the way uh, people perceived participating in the Olympics in yeah. 2016, yeah. but I do think overall Rio was a better success than anyone had anticipated. Yes. I think there was a lot less controversy. I mean, this is also from the perspective that we get at home yes. in the United States. Yes. Maybe if you talk to someone who, who's living in Rio, yeah, they the will tell you... the conditions that they've lived through, right. but they will tell you how they covered different. it up was pretty <laughs> well, and a lot of people focused on the glamour of sports instead of the political side of what was going on in Rio. Right. And but why we talk about the Olympics? Because, because it is one of the yeah. few events yeah. every two years, ironically speaking, that women in sports get majority of the yeah, coverage, especially coverage. in yeah. the Summer Olympics. Yeah, and especially in the sports of swimming and gymnastics and a little bit of soccer. And basketball, just because yeah. of domination, usually. Domination, and that's encouraged in the Olympics <laughs> this time. Like, in college basketball, to, it was right. discouraged because it's hurting the college system, but apparently it's great for our country in an international setting, which is the topic we will be covering as well in the future. Exactly. And that's another thing. If you guys have any topics that you think we're overlooking or things that you think we've missed, 
whether it be on the podcast or just in our the timeline of Throw Like a Girl Radio. Yes. Uh, it would be great to have those suggestions. Either tweet it to us, email it to us. You know the you know you, where to you reach know us. Links. We've been doing this for almost two years now. <laughs> I, I know, know, right? Is that it crazy? It's cr- I've known you for two years. <laughs> I know. That's that's weird. Uh, I know it's crazy. But let's get back to these Olympics. And what was your highlight? What was your favorite part of the Olympics? There was a lot of really good storylines. I think. Mm-hmm. That's one thing I really do always enjoy. There were so many good storylines this time around. I felt last Olympics was limited. And I always feel like in the Olympics especially, you Mm -hmm. get a better sense of the athlete's personality, where they're from, than you do in pretty much any other sporting event. Yeah. You know, even, especially, I guess, I always think it's, oh, maybe it's because it's always, it highlights a lot more individual events than, like, on a regular basis. Like, Mm -hmm. you know. Most of the, the mainstream leagues you follow here are team-based events. Yeah, they are team-based. You know, but I feel like even, you know, in the midst of the U.S. Open that we're in now, yeah. you don't even know that much about the individual athletes as far as past their career or their tenure with tennis, you know? Yes. And I feel like yeah. with the Olympics, I guess maybe because there's so much airtime to fill, they there do a lot so of much, features. It's 24-hour... Right, 24-hour coverage. And live and just like, streaming of it. And what I found interesting about the Olympics is that a lot of people didn't watch it on TV. They were streaming it through their phones and more of a digital platform, which that's was just yeah. I mean, I know that NBC was very, has been very, um, even the NFL I think is starting to do that, just trying yeah. to be ahead of that curve and of, reaching to us millennials over and here. Yeah, and being able to update the streaming services mm-hmm. and all of that stuff. So, which athlete do you think stood out to you? I mean, I think that. If you know me, you know my sister swims. I know. So So my family is very fascinated with swimming. I mean, swimming for a lot of people is only on during the two week the first week of the Olympics and yeah. you really don't talk about it otherwise. But it's on prime time though. Right. But in my house, swimming is on, you know, the collegiate swimming. Whenever yes. it's on TV, we're yes. usually watching it because my sister's very involved in it. Mm-hmm. So I'm always drawn to watching swimming. They don't realize how much skill goes into it. Like, it looks like, because yeah. everyone, not everyone, so it's like, yeah. a lot of people have been in the water. Yeah, So it's have. one of those things that you can, you know, you identify with because you've done it, and you're you've like, oh, like, how do you sweat? Because, because you're, right. And, and there's, there's so many parts of swimming. The there backstroke, really is. freestyle, what else do we have here? Because I'm not Butterfly, that familiar with swimming. Butterfly, uh, breaststroke. Yeah. Backstroke. Yeah, we got the relays going on. Melanie, and right, and the freestyle, and so there's, like, short look, course and long course, yeah. and there's tapering, and how important tapering is, and, like, their diets are insane, their training is insane. My sister wakes up at 5 a.m. every day and goes to practice, then, like, come, goes to school, then comes home and goes to another practice, like, Very in, intense stuff. But I think one of the, obviously, Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps, he's the, you know, like he, he's the face of swimming. Right. But we have an up-and-coming face of swimming there's a lot of Phelps. There's a lot of different... Yeah. There were a lot of unsung heroes, I think, this year in the Olympics. I mean, yes. just to talk about the, how dominant U.S. Olympics, U.S. swimming was, mm-hmm. if it was a country by itself, so just the U.S. swimming athletes, they would have been eighth in total medals. Just think wow. about that. So if there's, and there was 30 uh, first-time Olympians yes. in a U.S. swimming, mm-hmm. and 26 of them won a medal, so that means that Third, like almost all of them yeah. for the first time if there's the Olympics, they've medaled in an event. And you're in high pressure situations, and these athletes, let's remember, are 18 years old. Exactly, and they're so young. Yeah, and, and they're just like, and they're dealing with this. They're not even in college yet. U.S. swimming complete dominated. There was 32 events for swimming. USA uh, made the finals in all, 31 of them. Yeah. There were 32 gold medals in swimming. Half of them belonged to Team USA. Yeah. So that's not even talking about, like, this is just USA swimming in general. We're going to focus in on uh, the female swimmers. Yeah. But, I mean, Everyone knows the story. And two particular swimmers that right. really stood out to us. And maybe a third one, just her comment she made about um, what's going on with the I would like to start, I mean, Katie Ledecky was the headline for U.S. Swimming. Obviously. She was a star of U.S. Swimming. But I do think that Simone Manuel, 20 yeah. years old, first-time Olympian, she won two golds, two silvers. Yeah. She was the first African-American swimmer to win gold in an individual event. Specifically, her medal was for the 100-meter freestyle. Yes. And, I mean, obviously everyone knows it's a historical moment. It is. There uh, was many historical moments. There right? was. But I don't I think people really understand, you know, wow, this is great. I mean, NBC even got a little bit of backlash from it because they didn't live mm-hmm. broadcast her met her um, medal ceremony. It was on delay yeah. because I think gymnastics, the, like, one of the finals was on for that. So yeah. they, like, recorded it and then played it later in the day or, like, the next day. I forget the whole situation. Yeah. But... 
people don't understand, like, how significant this is. Like, Katie Ledecky, yes, yeah, she dominated, she set world records that she had, she yeah. held in the past, then broke them. She was just, yeah. like, completely, but, this was but that was expected. of her. Right. But this was unexpected, out of the blue, and you wouldn't expect this to happen. I don't think the Simone Manuel performance was unexpected, but I do think that people didn't think about the entire scope of the pressure that she was under while swimming in the Olympics, because she was swimming for something that is more than just a medal, more than being just the first black female to medal in an individual event. She was swimming for a greater cause. I spoke with Nicole Auerbach of USA Today, the national baseball writer, and she was there covering the Olympics and specifically focusing on USA Swimming. And she made a really good point, and I'll play most of the interview with her later on. But she talked about how this has so much more of a profound impact than the historical, monumental milestone it made. It has a greater impact on the black community in general. There was a study done in USA Today and back in 2014, so the numbers could be a little dated. African-American children from the ages of 5 to 19 are five times more likely to drown than white children. Now, swimming is not just a sport. It's a survival skill. So, there, also in this study, 60% of black children surveyed that they could not swim. So, having a face like Simone Manuel, like Helen Jones, is going to change that and lower drowning rates and have black children more inclined to want to swim because they see someone that looks like them who is doing it and being successful at it. And that in and of itself is a greater impact than any gold medal. And it is crazy that the grace that Simone Manuel has portrayed or has expressed this kind of overall cause that she is swimming for. And I think people are, when she came into the race, didn't actually have that on their mind when she got into the pool because it's not something that you automatically think about. There's no one that... If you're a little um, African American girl, yeah, and you don't see anyone like that's like huge you don't thing. See like anyone to look up to, right. and you can't relate to it, and, and now you now have a you face have to identify with. Yes. And it, but do you think this face is gonna go away in a couple of weeks? Because I feel like I don't the stardom of Olympic athletes. I mean, I don't think so because the time of the like Olympics. Colin Jones was a uh, he was a, a male black gold medalist um, when he perform when he medaled. The membership of African Americans grew fifty five percent, but still in USA Swimming, but still is only makes up one percent. Yeah. So this has so much more more than just it's you know, more significant. That she's the first uh, black female to medal yeah. in an individual event. It has so much like these greater it's implications. Gonna, it's going to impact the community more. Right, and it's going to teach more kids to learn how to swim. It's going to it's going to like decrease drowning rates and just have that you know because yeah. if a little little kids see people who look like them swimming, yeah, like it, I can yeah. do it too. So that's just yeah. so important, and I think that. You know, like good for her to exactly. take that and step and take that risk, and, and that's a lot of pressure. It is to be under and to know you have ba- exactly. But I don't think she really knows that. Because no, I, she's made comments about it that she definitely does realize the, you know, like the impact that she has. Yeah, a hundred percent. I don't think that's you can't deny that you're. Yeah, you can't. She can look around and say, "Hey, I'm like the only one who looks like the way I look." Yeah. So, but and she owns it. And she, and she performs up and to the standard. And she and three medals. Medal, she right. medaled three times, two silver and one gold, which is amazing. I think it was two and golds. Two golds? Let's check. Two golds, two silver, I believe. Two golds, two... Yeah, you got it. Two gold and two silver. So, she is a decorated Olympian, as well as Miss Katie Ledecky. Yeah, and just, like, going back to, like, how it's going to grow the amount of, of black swimmers if involved in mm-hmm. swimming... I think I a lot of people are like, oh, USA Swimming is going to be like so much more diverse. I can you can argue that the Olympics is a nas- an international event. Yeah. Like, I think that if you're a kid, you know, an African American kid yeah. from anywhere and see yeah. someone like like that's just not only in the United States, but now let's switch gears to Miss Katie Ledecky, who 19 years old, Alyssa. Yep. What were you doing at 19? Uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. Yes. And I'm still 22 now, and I still yes. am trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing the same exact thing with first year of college. <laughs> and she won five medals in total, four gold and one silver. But that sounds like, okay, like, you know, four gold medals. I mean, obviously, that's a great feat, but it, is. it but was in such a dominating fashion. Yeah. Like, World it was. records, Olympic records were broken, and they were her own records that she broke, too. Exactly. Um, one of, I think, the coolest storylines that came from Kayla Decky, like, yeah, she was totally dominant, but like I said, people expected it to happen. Like, yeah. they knew coming in that she was but a the star. the way she was dominant. I just think that, like, um, there was an interview, like, if, 
again, if you don't follow swimming on a regular basis, if you don't pay attention mm-hmm. other than that it comes on every four years in yeah. the Olympics, yeah. you're not aware that there is a 1500 meter freestyle event for men. There yeah. is not one for women. The mm-hmm. highest you can go is um, 800 meters. Not the highest you can go. The, the longest race longest for women race, yeah. is uh, 1800 meters. Why is that? I, I think it's just one of those things has kind of, like, been that way before yeah. maybe even there was, like, women uh, swimming involved in the Olympics, and they kind of just, like, never threw on the event. Yeah. But Kayla Decky was one of the f- um, athletes who commented and was like, yeah, I'd totally be down for that. Like, she swims it. Like, they have it in World yeah. Champs. They have it in other, co- like, international competition. Yeah, so why wouldn't they but for some reason, to the Olympics? It's just one extra event. And it also, like... Ratings. I think, but one of the things is, I think the ratings is the problem, because... The, the, I think the draw to swimming is, like, oh, my God, the best three seconds. Yeah. Like, not three seconds, but, like, it's so close it's so, and they're so, so short, yeah, you know? It's like, so quick. the races go by the like this, like this, like this. the attention span is very short with us. And I think that if you're going to do 1,500 meter, yeah. you're less likely to tune on for the entire length of the race. Yeah, but why do they do it with men? Why don't they just get rid of the race? I mean, maybe they don't add it for women Completely. because the ratings for men aren't good. So why are they going to add another? Well, why don't we just try? I know. I mean, there's a lot of probably there's a ton of events in these Summer Olympics that probably don't get great ratings. I mean, the stuff that's on at three o'clock in the morning that you and don't I, I kinda, see. I kind of watch that because <laughs> I'm you look at these sports that you've never heard of before. I know that's why I like the Olympics because you, I you see it. so many things you never like that aren't mainstream, and you're like, yeah, wow, this is so cool. Like, why isn't this mainstream? I know. And how do you get into that sport too? Exactly, how do you right? For it? How do you make it your livelihood? Which I find very fascinating. But at the end of the day. Some of the sports are viable to have that um, international yeah. following. Um, but she also made a decision while she was at the Olympics to continue to uh, be classified as an amateur swimmer. Yes. And not to go pro because she's going, I believe, to Stanford she's University. Going to Stanford to, and, and joining to... uh, Simone some, some Manuel. So yes, there's and... a bunch of girls from the, the Olympic team who swim for Stanford. So. I know. It's, it's probably a great collegiate program. And she might study psych. That's I cool. was listening to an interview and she might go into major in psychology. And what I found also interesting is she turned down $5 million in endorsements annually. To go to Stanford and to maintain that amateur status. So that was probably a big decision for her. And yeah, I when mean... When you think about that decision, like, you're 19 years old and $5 million is being thrown at you and all these endorsements, guaranteed. Yeah, but I also think that... you want that college education. Yeah, exactly. I think a college education will take you further. And, you know, I think that there's a... that pro status to pass... Because you're 19. How long is a swimmer's career, you, you think? Pro- I mean, think Michael Phelps, like... He's yeah, but Michael done. Phelps is a different breed. You're of right, human. but like, like let's say million. she does stay as dominant as she is and continues yeah, to you know come that. back and back and back. But, but is that like, a guarantee? After she's yet? thirty, like she's not going to be able to continue. So, yeah. I mean, I just think that also there's a sense of pride in uh, competing mm-hmm. on a collegiate level. There um, is, but and I think that that's something that can be matched in other ways as a pro. You know, yeah. But endorsements come around once in a while, and especially after the Olympics, these offers come around and. With a lot of these college athletes, too. The Olympics give them these endorsements. And if you don't take advantage of them, you might not have them in 2020 when the next Olympics come around. You're right, but Depending I think on that your performance too. Like it's a noble to... choice, and I think it's... No, I respect her for the decision to go into college, but it was probably a tough one to make. Yeah, I just want to say one other thing. Like, I, like people... To finish our swimming. Yeah, like, there was one person who I recently learned about. I didn't even learn about her while she was swimming. Yeah. Um, Kathleen Baker, she was another first-time Olympian. She won two medals, one gold and one silver, Mm -hmm. one gold for within the relay, and a silver for the backstroke. Yeah. Um, she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and Mm -hmm. I don't know if any, a lot of people don't know what it is. It's an autoimmune disease, and basically, like, all of our stomachs have this acid in there, or this bacteria, that our body knows is, like, you know, helps break down food or whatnot, and, you know, is supposed to be there. When you have Crohn's disease, the your body, your immune system, your immune system attacks this bacteria. Yeah. And it causes it's a disease you live with for life, and it's very, very painful. It can flare up at any moment. Flares up a lot of the time in high pressure, high stress situations. Yeah. Because hello, Olympic swimming trials, all that stuff to qualify the Olympics seems like it would be very high pressure and high yeah, stress. Yeah, obviously. Um, but I think that you know a lot of people talking about uh, Simone Manuel being the face, you know, the face of black swimming, the face of yeah. that, and I think that is a hundred percent important, and you know, yeah. has a lot of implications that are very, very necessary for today's day and age. But I so often think that 
autoimmune diseases get a lot less attention from the media and mm-hmm. the world because they're you can't physically see them. Yeah. And I think that People fact that she is outside and inside your Yeah. She is living with this, and she's meddling with it, and there's only 700,000 people Mm -hmm. in the United States, I believe, who live with Crohn's disease, and it's just, I think it's really important. Another thing for, like, autoimmune disease, like lupus, arthritis, all this stuff, it's like, there's not a spokesperson for it, and I think that that was a story that I wish I heard about while the Olympics was going on. Yeah, because it didn't get covered as much. Right. It didn't. Yeah. You know, think about how, if you have an, an... you know, chronic disease, how you're training and all that, your scheduling has yeah. to be... Plus the medication you're taking, You know, too. adjusted, right. Yeah. And you have to contribute... Like, you're not only is training so hard, but you have all these other... Yeah. Components. Factors that go into your training exactly. that you have to be aware of and be careful with. And it's commendable and great job by Kathleen. Yeah. So now we're going to play you a piece of our... Of uh, the interview uh, with Nicole Auerbach. Mm-hmm. Um... We will tweet out her handle. She has, yes. covers a lot of great stuff. Uh, she covers a lot of stuff that a lot of people, I think, tend to overlook. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I hope you enjoy the interview. Yes. So, on the phone with me, I have Nicole Auerbach, the USA Today national basketball writer, and she also did the coverage for USA Swimming in the Olympics this year. So, you've had an eventful summer. I mean, you got to go to Rio. That's awesome. Yeah, and swim trials, two weeks in Omaha, so it was um, a lot busier than usual for an off-season. And how was Rio? Was it as bad as they depicted on through the media? Because it seemed like it was somewhat of, you know, a train wreck, but on the the, um, broadcast, it looked beautiful. Yeah, well, it definitely, like, had those elements where, like, there was the favelas and the poverty and and, like, the dangers and street crime and stuff. But, like, honestly, from my experience and a lot of my colleagues, like, we didn't really have any issues at all. Like, it went a lot smoother than planned. Um, I mean, most of the time you're in media, buses, and transportation and, um, you know, in the Olympic Park. Especially when I was doing swimming for the first eight days, I basically just stayed in the park all day. Um, So I really wasn't out and about. But, I mean, as long as people were smart and, like, sharing Uber rides and stuff, I mean, there really wasn't that much. There were a few athletes I know that had some issues and uh, some photographers that had equipment stolen. But, you know, it could have been a lot worse. I mean, I think people were expecting a lot worse going in, so maybe that was part of it. But, like, it was totally fine. I did have one afternoon off. I went to Sugarloaf Mountains. I kind of got to see all of Rio. Um, And it was beautiful. I mean, I've never seen a city like that with the beaches and the mountains so close to each other um so you know it was it was definitely a, a cool place a unique place um i sort of wish a couple of my colleagues stayed a few days to explore and do some of the touristy things like christ the redeemer i sort of wish i was able to do that um but maybe another time it, you know it was it was definitely exhausting from a work standpoint which the olympics always are so it's a little hard to get a great sense of the city wherever you are but like with london i'd been there before so I didn't really need it, um, but this would be a place that I'd be interested in going back. Now, did you get to uh, view the Olympic dorms at all? Were they? Because I saw, you know, a bunch of tweets from various teams tweeting out, you know, like leaking leaks and all that stuff. Did you get to see any of that? Was that as um, run down as they made it seem? No, you know, we don't um, have access to the Olympic, the Athlete Village. Um, but you know, honestly, that stuff always happens a little bit. Um, I, you know, I know that they're. Australia, you know, I think was, I think that's who you're referring to, like, you know, was, was posting about that, but, you know, like the media village where, which had been built for where I was staying, like some of my coworkers were at hotels, but they had built media village. I mean, the first few days, like, I mean, the lock on my door broke and I got locked out of my room and they had to like change the lock. I mean, that, that stuff kind of always happens. Like in Sochi, there were a lot of people talking about like missing doorknobs and think shower heads and things like that um so i feel like after the first couple of days of that stuff i didn't really hear any of it um which i think is fairly normal and especially because like rio was in such a time crunch to finish building some of these things um you know and obviously the pool turned green and the diving pool like there were there were those kinds of issues but for the amount of attention and like upheaval and like economic and political instability there i really thought it was so minor compared to what it could have been um, and, and like I said, I mean, the media village, there were no bars or restaurants or anything around it. That was kind of frustrating because you're getting home from work at like 3 a.m. and really hungry. Right. Um, but the actual like housing was totally fine. Okay, good. So a little bit different from what it was depicted in the mainstream media. Um, yeah, the one well, that... like, I, like I said, yeah, I didn't think like my coworkers 
you know, maybe it was just some tweets or what you're seeing from the athletes, but like from from my perspective, it was totally fine. Great. So two of the biggest stories coming out of the Rio games is Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky. And now Mm -hmm. uh, Katie Ledecky just completely dominated four gold, one silver, breaking world records, even world records that she's been on her own. Uh, Could you just talk about how how the reception was around covering a female athlete that was so dominant? Because when you think about dominant female athletes, you think about Serena Williams. And, you know, every time the Olympics comes around, there's always, like, this one shine-out female athlete. And this year it was between Simone Biles and Katie Ledecky. So can you just talk about how it was to cover and the reception around her accomplishments these games? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone in the swimming media contingent, you know, anyone who's or anyone who paid close attention in the last three years, like, knew she was going to do this. So for the last, like, three years, I've been writing stories, like, here's Katie Ledecky. She's the most dominant athlete in the world, in my opinion. I mean, you could have that argument with Simone or, or Serena, but the most dominant swimmer for sure. Um, you should know who she is. You should know who she is. And, like, nobody really reads too much mainstream, like, you know, regular sports fans. They really don't general – sports fans like they pick it up you know maybe you're on trials like olympic years so she still was flying under the radar despite the fact that like everyone in the swimming community was like in awe of her um so it was sort of very interesting knowing she was going to do all of that expecting her to break at least one of the world records the 400 or 800 um and thinking that she would win gold in the two in 200 as well um and become just the second female swimmer to to win three different freestyle individual events so like, I knew all that, but I knew that we had to be ready because, like, the the audience didn't know that. Um, so it was just really interesting. And I think that because of the way she swims and because of the way she wins her distance events, um, you knew, like, right off the bat with the 400 that, like, people were just going to be in awe of the margin of victory. And so it was fascinating to watch that evolve throughout the week. And and she also, you know, did more relay. You know, she did the 4 by 100 relay, which I wasn't necessarily expecting going in. Um, and she was just amazing throughout. And – I think that by the time she got to the 800, her last event, like, I was seeing on my Twitter feed that, like, all of these people who don't care about swimming except, you know, when it's on TV for two weeks each year, every four years, like, they were, like, glued to their seats during the 800, which usually is not the race that people are glued to their seats in. They usually get off and do something else during that one. Um, And so I think that, like, everyone understood, like, very instantly because it's so visual, like, her dominance, which was incredible and, like, I could tell that the feedback of, like, I could tell how many people were reading things I was writing about Katie and tweeting about Katie, Um, you know, and I think that people understood, you know, she's 19, she's not going anywhere, and she had a phenomenal Olympics, and that, like, she was so matter-of-fact about it until that last race that she was finally emotional that, like, everyone was just, I think, in awe of her. Um, So it was really cool to cover, and I think that it was great to see her do, you know, what she's been doing for the last three years. Like there's obviously there's potential for stage fright and like nerves and, and issues and things like that. Um, but I think people were just kind of in awe of her and, and it wasn't what I appreciated at least in my office and the people I was talking to and what I was reading online was it wasn't framed as like, Oh, she's the next Michael Phelps or she's going to take the baton from Michael Phelps. It was just like, here is this phenomenal swimmer who is going to be the face of swimming. Like, it wasn't as much compared to Michael Phelps, which, I I mean, I've I've asked Michael about her dominance. Um, He said that she reminds him of him when he was younger and so focused. And, you know, there there certainly are parallels, but because they swim such different events and, like, their schedules are so different, I just appreciated that there was a lot of appreciation for Katie on her own, um, which was pretty awesome. So I thought she was treated with a lot of respect. I thought the conversations around her were, were great. And I thought that she deserved it. That's a, that's awesome. I, I also feel like my sister um, is a swimmer and she, her and all her friends, they want to be Kayla Decky, which is great because yeah. I feel like before this, they were, Oh my God, Michael Phelps, he's the best swimmer. Like that's who you want to be. But now they have, you know, their own role models and they can relate to even more um, through Kayla Decky. But it was just like a great story to watch. Um, and yeah, and I think also there was there there was just sorry just qu- real quick there was also the side effect of Simone Manuel, and right. I've already seen that like little black girls like in swim caps and goggles going for the first swim lessons because they want to be like Simone Manuel, which I think right. is also awesome. So there yeah, there was like, there was two parts to that for the women. Like there was also an African American community that sees Simone Manuel as like I can be her too, and also the, any woman you know the Katie Lesky part. And you wrote a piece about how there is no 
Olympic event for the 1500 freestyle, 1500 meter freestyle. That's only an event for male um, male athletes, and the only the highest, the longest instance is the 800 free, which Katie Becky did end up winning. Um, in your article, you said that you know there are people, there are women who are interested in swimming this in the Olympics. And what do you think would be the the um, the, the urge to push it up to you know to urge the Olympics to put this event in the Olympics? for, you know, for women to compete in? Well, I think, you know, Katie Ledecky said that she would like to swim it. Um, I mean, she holds the world record in it, uh, right. but they just they swim it at world championships, just not the Olympics. And, like, obviously, I mean, I don't think that there should be any difference in the programs offered and the, the events offered for men and women, and there isn't in a lot of sports. There's not. They're exactly the same in the Olympics. Um but for whatever reason, they, they they were not implemented that way, and there's perception about, you know, I think I, I quoted in there Debbie Meyer, who's, um, you know, swam all the freestyle events, like about, oh, like, you know, women aren't strong enough or tough enough or whatever, or it's too boring or whatever, et cetera, et cetera, all these different reasons that people throw out there for that. Um, I do think it would be a harder sell to add just because interest in, like, distance events is not as much as there is in sprint events. They're shorter, shorter retention span, they're more exciting. Um, but I mean, I would think that this would be, so in, in one sense, like, you know, like Debbie thought that if they're going to add events, it'll be like the 50 fly or like the other fifties, um, because it would be exciting, but you know, you could either get rid of the 800 and have the mile, you know, 1500 for the men and the women, or Katie was saying you could also add the 800 for the men and add the 1500 for the women. But it, you know, there, it just, it should be the same. Um, and I think that the way that Katie Ledecky's so dominant in all the freestyle distances and started as a distance swimmer, you would think that even though, yes, people have shorter attention spans and, like, so much is being, you know, kind of packaged or, or geared around the TV audience and what they're interested in, you would think that if Katie Ledecky wants to swim at 1500 and, like, you know, people are interested in her and they want to see her, um, you know, in the event that, honestly, I mean, the march, we're talking about the margin of victory was 11 seconds in 800, it would be you know, like she would lap people in the 1500, but you know, that, so I feel like at the same point as, you know, there's an urge, shorter things, exciting events, blah, blah, blah. You know, you'd also think that if this is like an event that Katie Ledecky would like showcase event for her, that maybe there's a shot that they would do it. I, you know, I don't know if there is, I just thought, you know, it's an interesting piece. And especially when you have the world record holder in the event, not able to swim it in the Olympics and get a gold medal in it. Um, you know, I just think it's a conversation worth having. For sure. And you mentioned uh, Simone Manuel before, and she was the first African-American female swimmer to win gold in an individual event. And you talked about how this, like, changes the description, you know, the the face of swimming. And how do you think that this is going to transcend not only in the United States swimming, but also interna- on an international level because she was seen on an international stage achieving this? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, across the board, there's not, across the international teams, there's not a ton of black swimmers. So I think it does, you know, affect that. Um, You know, what was really interesting, so, like, after Simone won and she had that incredible, you know, reaction to seeing that she had gotten a gold medal and then she's crying on the medal stand, um, you know, her mom talked to reporters the next day. I I called Colin Jones, um, you know, who has long been kind of the African-American face of swimming in the U.S. um, And he – it was just interesting because Simone so readily kind of talked about the impact of, kind of swimming for an entire community and like just beyond yourself and kind of pressures that, that, that comes with that. And, um, and her, and her mom talked about that, that it was something that they talked about as she was growing up and, you know, through high school that like, she was never really going to swim just for herself. Like it was always going to represent something more because that's what happens when you're a minority in the sport. Um, and it was, and, and Colin was really interesting. He obviously has been carrying this for, you know, almost a decade. And he was saying that, you know, it took him a little while to get used to that. Like, you know, when he got, he got, um, you know, gold medal as part of the re- relay in Beijing, he came back and then understood and then was getting texts from, you know, black swimmers on their team being like, I'm the only one on my team. Like, this is so inspiring, et cetera, et cetera. And he was just really impressed that Simone already understood that part of her role. And, and you know, it's not like you can say that's fair or not fair or whatever. It's just, it's kind of just how it is when you, are a minority in in the sport and you represent a lot more to a lot of people. So I think that she's embracing that. And I think that's really cool. Um, You know, I don't know if one person 
makes a huge difference in that. But we've seen it across other sports, what Serena and Venus were able to do um, in tennis. Um, you know, they, it, one person can make a difference. You know, it may not be super noticeable at the next Olympics. It might be, you know, it might just be a bunch of, um, there might be African-American kids all around the U.S. who learn how to swim and never become competitive swimmers, but they learned how to swim because she did. And that is a tar- that is a community that has higher rates of drowning and water-related deaths. And, and so it's such an important thing, and, and it, like, regardless of the competition part. Like it's such a like water safety is so important that I think that um, that that's even a side effect that we'll never be able to measure. But that's a really cool piece to this that she could actually really be saving people's lives, you know. And that's so much more important than if we see you know three more African American women on the next Olympic team. Yeah, for sure. And it's crazy to think that all the pressure she was under, having that you know that mindset, not that she's representing more than just herself, like a whole entire community, and she was still able to perform as well as she did. Um, another story that I loved throughout the USA Swimming was Lily King. Can you just tell me a little bit about that for some people who like maybe didn't follow or didn't catch that storyline throughout the Olympics? Yeah, well, it was very unlikely. Um, I, you know, if, if anyone had given me a list of like potential breakout stars of the swim team, I would not have guessed Lily King would be it. But basically, what happened was um, NBC had cameras in the ready room, and I guess earlier in the day, Lily had um, finished her heat, I think, in the prelims and like put up a number one. You know, she she won her heat, and then so the semifinals were that night, and. Uh, Yulia Smova from Russia, who had been very slyly added back onto the heat sheets. She was one of the, um, I think there were five total Russian swimmers who were originally banned um, and then just, you know, kind of made their way onto heat sheets and Sina never gave, you know, an explanation why. And so Yulia Smova wins her heat in the semifinal, which was the first one, and she sort of wags her finger a little bit and Lily King sees this. And then she's in the ready room, and she does, like, a Dikembe Mutombo finger wag back, like, oh, no, you know? So that's caught. And then NBC asked her about after she wins her heat in the other semifinal, and she kind of just goes off about how she doesn't, you know, she's just not a fan of Efimova or someone who's failed a drug or has been twice banned for sub- for using substances that were banned. Um, and basically just, like, completely owns it and double down, doubles down on it and, you know, just talks about, you know, basically becomes the face of, like, anti-doping and clean sport by going after the Russian swimmers who were, who had failed drug tests and were allowed to compete. Um, So it added this crazy, like, Russia-U.S. Cold War element to things. It added this whole, like, here was the whole Russian doping scandal. Like, this was the center of it because people were talking about it. It was, like, being, it was, like, they were going to swim in the pool for the women's 100 breaststroke gold medal together, like against each other, like for all the marbles, it like just charged the entire week. Um, and it was pretty crazy. And then for anyway, Lily King does win gold, um, Yulia Fomovo and silver. And they had to sit in a press conference together and like answer questions about it. Um, and afterwards, Lily was like, you know, just saying, she just kept saying like, she's so proud of herself and, and for doing it clean and really kind of twisting that tagger in there. Um, so by the end of the week, like, you felt really bad for, for Yulia Fomova because she's trying to explain herself and, and what the, you know, what the substances were, and she just felt attacked, um, and she said that, like, Lily King had caused a war, basically, that week, <laughs> just how difficult it was for her, um, and she left with uh, another silver in the 200 breaststroke, and I think she won a medal in a relay. So she actually had a pretty incredible meet for the amount of scrutiny she was under, um, and Lily King also got a gold medal in the medley relay. Um, so, yeah, it was just kind of this out-of-nowhere story that was, like, super heated um, and just, like, I think everyone back home was just, like, enthralled by her because she said all this stuff and backed it up and won a gold medal and beat the beat the Russian swimmer she had chastised. So it was, it was fascinating. Now, a lot of the time when female athletes react in certain ways, they're scrutinized because it's different from when a male athlete acts a certain way, it shows his passion and whatnot, but then a lot of times when a female athlete would do the same thing, it's often perceived differently. Was there that kind of, um, any kind of, like, feedback about that? Because, I mean, I know it's obviously, like, you know, everyone gets super patriotic when the Olympics are on, so people are probably eating it up, like, you know, like, going back to that, like, U.S.-Russian rivalry again, but was there any kind of, like, she wasn't being sports, uh, you know, like, practicing good sportsmanship and things like that? 
Well, there was a little bit of that, and I think that would have come about for a male athlete as well, um, because you know it was it was it was a little bit over the top um, and just like very kind of repetitive and 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 you know like I said they had a press conference where they were in the same room and um, you know there were questions about you know no I guess none of the none of the people in the final went and congratulated Julie on getting a silver medal. So Lily was asked about that, and she said, you know, if I were in her shoes, I wouldn't have wanted me to congratulate either because, like, I've been saying stuff. You know, it was just there there was some uncomfortableness with that, but I think that that would have happened for male athletes. I mean, the Michael Phelps, um, Chad LeClo, like the death glare, you right. know, the Phelps face. Like, there there were certainly questions about their relationship, their rivalry. Are they actually friends? You know, so, like, I think that was going both genders. Um, the one thing that Lily did answer about, and she addressed it head on, was saying that people, like, I think people were phrasing questions like, people are surprised that you were so, you know, whatever. And she was like, I'm not this shy little girl. I'm not like, you know, I speak my mind and, and this and that. So she sort of addressed that, that you would expect maybe a female athlete to be more toned down or, you know, someone who looks like her and is her age, she's only 20. Um, that she's going to be quiet and timid or whatever. And she was like, that's not me. So this is me, you know? And, and I think that that was, that was really empowering too. Um, and refreshing because, you know, a lot of times, even if people are pretty opinionated behind closed doors, they don't always show that self to the media um, and to the public. So, you know, she addressed that part head on. Um, and, and I think people really appreciated and respected that she wasn't trying to pretend like she was, you know, what maybe a society views, you know, maybe a female swimmer of her age. Right. Uh, Was there any other storylines that kind of went under the radar with with, uh, U.S. swimming or even just in the Olympics in general that you could, you know, that maybe didn't catch on uh, as much as the main ones have? Well, certainly anything that happened the second week was overshadowed by, like, the Ryan Lochte um, incident. So, you know, that was a little – that was – it was interesting in terms of coverage because I've covered Ryan – um, you know, I know him and people around him. So I got pulled into that and, and reporting that, which made total sense. But usually, like in London was my first Olympics, you know, you do swimming for the first eight days, and then I would cover tennis, beach volleyball, indoor volleyball, like you bounce around. And that didn't really get to happen just because you had to devote so much energy to the to the lofty stuff. I did get to beach volleyball once. Um, and I saw Kerry Walsh Jennings lose, which was actually like not, that was pretty shocking. But yeah. um you know, I, the, the thing with swimming was there were so many storylines. It was like every single night. I mean, again, the Lily King thing popped out of nowhere. Um, and then that was a dominant storyline for a few days. Maya Dorado had an incredible Olympics, you know, and maybe didn't get a ton of coverage because a lot of her races were the same nights as maybe Michael Phelps' last individual race or, you know, this or that. And, um, you know, there were almost, there were, there were so many things going on. Like, if, you know, Katie and Michael were swimming on the same night. Um, you know, obviously each of them get a big story and then try and figure the rest out. I, I was fascinated by Anthony Irvin's story. Um, I thought it was, that was an amazing gold medal 16 years after winning a gold medal and then leaving the sport and the drugs and alcohol and depression, and all of the stuff that he went through. Um, you know, that, you know, maybe if there weren't like five amazing stories every day out of swimming, you know, maybe that would have been, you know, a slightly bigger deal. Um, I thought track had a lot of big stories. And, again, they were sort of overshadowed by this lofty thing that was happening. But, like, the, the women, you know, the sprinters, they were fantastic. Um, there there was just – I basically, just to answer your question, I'm, like, I'm like rambling. But the, it, basically anything that happened the second week was just sort of under the radar. Um, and, and, it, and, like, one thing that just surprised me, and this might be the wrong perception since I wasn't back in the U.S. during the second week, but it seemed like there was so much tension on swimming – and so much attention on Simone Biles and gymnastics. I For don't know, sure. Like, usually, usually track is also up there with those two sports. Like, usually everyone is just as into track, and I feel like track took a backseat to the other two sports this time, which I don't know why. Usually everyone loves track. Like, it's exciting. It's fun. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Maybe because the U.S. was so dominant in swimming and gymnastics, it sort of, I, you know, I'm not sure. That was a surprise to me. And there you have it. That was an interview that Alyssa just happened to call Airbach. Thank you so much. For taking the time out of your day. Yeah, to really speak appreciate with us. it. It was a great conversation. It was great. It was very insightful. Great experience. And hopefully, we could have you on again to talk about basketball. Right. National coverage yeah. of, uh, for USA Today. And that was our first interview we've done on this podcast. And we will continue to do interviews with notable people in this industry athletes, writers, pertaining to the topics that we want to talk about. So, thank you, Nicole, for being the inaugural interview. <laughs> <laughs> and now. 
so much has happened over the summer, and so many top stories and headlines have broken this past couple of months. Week, let alone a I know, so what do you think? We got yesterday big news from the New York Mets. <gasps> they have taken on the project of Tim Tebow, future Major League Baseball player. Yeah, I don't think it's so much they've taken on. I think they signed him. I think they did it for... There's so many rumors going around about what they did it for. Yeah, if you saw... I mean, I am currently employed by MLB Network, and I was um, working the day that he had his tryout, and mm-hmm. if you just look at his uh, video from that day, he can't... He, it's so... He oh, so yeah. awkwardly feels an uh, a fly yeah. ball. Like... I just, the thing that bothers me the most about this is that there have been people who have been in the system for years and years and years, have worked their butts Butts off, off, and they will never get the look that he got, and that's what's um, disheartening to me, because he also is going to miss, he already said he was going to miss a bunch of uh, practices and all that stuff because of his media obligations. I just don't understand. He could, you can know, he can, you can argue that he was one of the best collegiate players ever. Yeah, He's a great analyst. Yes, he is. He has a great gig. He's making millions of dollars. Leave it alone. overpaying him for the for the face, to be the face of SEC, and I think he should stick to broadcasting. I know everyone has an athlete in you, because we played softball growing up, and we would love yeah. to go back to playing I mean, that, and we have that competitiveness in us, but sometimes you have to accept the fact that I mean, he was throwing over. to home, and like, not making it. Like, you were a quarterback. Yeah, but they said, <laughs> but they said he would be better off as a DH, and the Mets, you're a national league team, we do not well, have Well, that's apparently DH. going to be taken out. Oh, we'll the see. Like, Robin Fred so. sends all, says all these things to see how the public perceives them and how the public puts it into writing and talks about it. So you never know what's going to happen with that. But I feel like with Tim Tebow, he shares the same agent as Yohan assessed for this. I did so hear you think that. that could have been like a I little heard that. And also think that based on the Mets moves this offseason, they are still at a place where they are interested in turning over a dollar. Yeah. Um, and there's yeah. no doubt that the, he's going to get the publicity. He's going to fill the oh, seats. I mean, and we don't need training. another outfielder, though. We don't. We have enough in our farm system. We have enough on the bench currently for the Mets. So I think this is just a little thing. We're going to throw you a ball and see what you do. Other than that, we're going to He's not going to make it to the major, so it doesn't no, matter. No, he's not. So it's just get a your Brooklyn story that I'm already done. Ready. I'm already done. Uh, I'm already over uh, reading it. About. We spoke about enough at the fan yesterday. I'm tired. I don't want to <laughs> hear about it anymore. And what else has happened? The World Cup of Hockey is coming into Yep, started, existence. Yep, uh, scrimmage just started up yesterday. That's really cool. I'm really excited to have hockey back. I'm excited. I'm at a point, and that's, uh, every year I get to a point in the summer, I'm like, all right, I'm like, I'm done with baseball. I'm done. I know. Like, football just starts, so I'm not really into it yet, but, yeah. like, just ready for hockey to come back. I'm ready, ready for hockey. Just, I'm not uh, ready for the World Cup, though. I, I am I excited like, for that, I because know. I feel like that's going to be really interesting to watch. Like, just, I don't know. I just think that it's going to be really cool. Really, really cool. And also, since I have never seen one before, I know, but it's, it's the first time they're doing it. I just, I'm, I'm not looking forward to it as a hockey fan. I feel like it takes it away from the season. And God forbid, Henry oh. Blomquist gets injured. We're done for the oh, regular it's season. Okay. Uh, I think JT Miller got hurt yesterday, but it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It, it, there's no point in having this World Cup of hockey. And if you want to get, I think it's good for the sport. You think it's a good? For I the think sport? it's 100 percent good for the sport. It's already an people love sport. backing the United States. And that's the way you're going to grow it here? That's the way you're going to grow it here. And okay. I also just think that... Are the jerseys selling? I feel like they're at the NHL even, store. I don't want to take them off. I mean, they're the, expensive. I know my sister and my dad went the other day, and they didn't buy anything because too expensive. I want to buy it either, to be honest. It's another jersey. You I know. know I'm pumped. I'm glad hockey's back a month sooner than it normally would be. It's okay. I'm not complaining. I'm excited for football for once in my life, even though why? my QB... <laughs> like, why are you excited? Okay, what's, what's with the attitude? We have, Mark, we have Mark Sanchez now. Class. We have Mark Sanchez now. Oh, yeah, that works out. That's going to work out well. Come on, we get the Super Bowl this year. we got Dak Prescott, which I have confidence in here. We have Zeke. So I think we'll see how it goes on September 11th when the Dallas Cowboys take on the, the Giants. Giants. The Jets open up that day, too, at And home. the Mets, too, tied for a wild card spot. I'm There's done with the Mets. You're done with the Mets. I'm done with the Mets. Okay, everyone. Alyssa always says she's done with no, the Mets. No, I am. Honestly, Daniel think Martin. about it. I tell uh, me why. Because okay, if they make the wild card, great. It's gonna be really cool. I love the wild card game. I don't think I've ever. I don't remember a time seeing the Mets in the wild card game. Yes. It's gonna be really cool. Yes. But they're not gonna make it further than the NLDS. So I'm just not really, you know, I not into I it. Like, I don't like this. Well, anyway, it doesn't you matter. Know, I'm, I'm done with it. It's fine. You're done. You're you know, back to hockey. Get me in the next year when everybody's healthy. And Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hopefully when everyone's healthy. <laughs> this year everyone was supposed to be healthy. We're supposed to have the, the um, dominant starting pitching. 
in the league, and they're all either Tommy yeah. John oh, or fine. done for the season. Bartolo Colon's been a leading the way. That you, did yeah. you think that was? Did you think they were going to sign Tebow? Did you think that Bartolo Colon was going to be the star of the rotation? Think Bart- and t- I don't think so. Considering they're re-signing Bartolo Colon for next season, I, I mean, didn't think so either. I've even heard people say that they would throw Colon out for the wild card. <laughs> for the wild card. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But whatever. Okay. Um, this is- are we? I think that's it. Yeah. So is that all the things we should? Touch it's on? all stuff I have to touch on. We so, did swimming for the first time. Who knew? I know. I know because we never. It's always on during the summer, and we are never no. around for it. I mean, I don't think we. The show wasn't even on. Yeah. When we in the last Olympics, so 2012, yeah. we were. Yeah. No. We did our first ever interview. Actually, you did, and it went really well. So I'm very proud of you. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. I'm gonna continue uh, doing reaching out and stuff. So. Yeah. So guys, please listen and follow us on all social media platforms. Twitter. At throw like a underscore girl, Facebook throw like a girl radio, Instagram and, throw like a girl radio, and then YouTube just search uh, throw YouTube, like a girl radio, iTunes. Listen to us on your way to work because yeah. now all of our friends are employed people, yes. so you have commutes to do, and you guys have time to listen to exactly. us. There's a thing called an iPhone, and they just came out with the iPhone Seven. If you want to buy one <laughs> to like listen to us, um, oh, what yeah. else? I think that's it. What? I don't. Great we, job, I feel Melissa. like we should have some type of like sign off, sign off for this. I know. What should be our? Should we do like a? Maybe say? we should do that. Like, you know, hey, if you have an idea, why don't you tweet us? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or an idea for a sign off because I'm it, we're yeah, on the spot have, now and yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I, I don't because a lot of people. Puck Daddy does like be loyal and stay lit. Bill Simmons is like good job by you. We should do something. Yeah, Da does be good to one another. The mothership. Woo-hoo! Yeah. Um. <laughs> Guys, no, we'll, we'll come up with here. something. We'll, we'll come up with something, but have a great week, everyone. And, and we'll, we don't know what we're talking about next time, yeah, but, but we will tweet it out and let you know. Yeah, I'm Carrie Angelotti. And I'm Melissa Palacelli, and thanks for listening to the first ever Throw Like a Girl Radio podcast. <laughs>